chapter 12 and beginning in verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly, despise not the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. To consider him who endured. Have you wondered how to get through life in a world in which everything may be crashing down? The word world turmoil is no often breaking news. It is the news. How do you endure how do you live a life of faithfulness to the Lord? Well, he tells us by considering Jesus, which I'm sure we're in favor of, and then by receiving the discipline of the Lord. To consider him who endured, he who endured hostility against himself. Sometimes we have the idea that in preaching and sharing the gospel of Christ, that everyone will receive that word gladly and with joy. But the truth is, if they did not receive Jesus gladly and with joy, then often they will not receive us in the same manner as well. How Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He endured hostility against himself from sinners. And so the hostility that put him on the cross was not simply the Roman guards or the Jewish cohort, but the sin of you and I. He endured despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, the eternal weight of the world on his shoulders. Philippians 2 tells us that let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, though he was God, did not account equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And so we can run with endurance by looking to the one who endured. And because of that, he tells us not to grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, there's a difference between being weary of the work and being weary in the work. And I think he describes the latter here, to be Weary or faint-hearted? Do you have signs of spiritual burnout in your life? I think sometimes we just get tired of doing the same things over and over again, wanting if there'll ever be anything else. Here's some symptoms of it. Exhaustion, trouble sleeping, feeling isolated or disconnected, growing apathy toward the work, pessimism or cynicism, critical attitudes, Lacking any interest in success, developing health problems, persistent thoughts about leaving the ministry, either vocational ministry or the ministry that God has called you to, feeling unappreciated, dreading going to church. Imagine that. See, there's a weariness in the body, but there's also a weariness of soul. There's a weariness that comes from the aging and the dying process, but the writer here may be referring to a different type of death, and that is what dies inside of us while we live. I don't know what birthdays you have had trouble with in your life. Some of you may be perpetually on 29 or 39, and you've just started repeating that year after year. If you do that, that's okay. You know, turning 30 didn't bother me too much. I'm going to be 33 in a few months, so you can make cash check or order 125 Jefferson Street, you know, P.O. Box 57. We'll take it all. If you want to write a card, that's great. 
I'll tell you the birthday that did bother me, and it's silly why it did. 27. And you say, why is that? Because I read a Mark Twain quote. Mark Twain has a way with words, and here's what he said. He said, most men die at 27. We just bury them at 72. <laughs> and I just started looking around at my, are my dreams gone, Lord? Is, is this the end? They said Caesar, when he turned 33, sat down and wept because he hadn't accomplished everything that Alexander had by his time frame. Man, it can be difficult when life doesn't turn out the way that you thought it would, when the world seems in turmoil. But that's why we can't compare ourselves with our circumstances or with other people. We have to compare ourselves with Jesus. We have to look to Him to the one who endured. We have to remind ourselves in times of trouble of the truth of God's word, how David encouraged himself in the Lord, how Paul said, though the outer man is perishing, my inner man is being renewed day by day. We sing that old song, are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. And Galatians 6, 9 tells us, do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So many people, Give up in the darkness right before they see the light. And if that's you, press on. Keep going. Because endurance is counted in the kingdom of God. The measurement of the life of a believer is faithfulness or endurance. And he tells us there will be many obstacles along the way because the goal of the enemy is either to cause you not to finish the race, to discourage you away from the race, or to cause you to dishonor the Lord in the race. But hear me out, you have to endure. It is the only way that you'll see Jesus. The one who endures to the end will be saved, the Bible tells us. You know, we're not here this morning just to be here. In fact, the Scripture tells us that though we can't see it, we're fighting an all-out war against all the armies of hell, and we're fighting for souls. And we got recruits who are going AWOL while the world is desperately out there in need of the gospel. And there are people in here who desperately need to be strengthened in their faith. And this falling away that is described in Hebrews is something that can happen to anyone, lest we think it not happen to us. To me, the most discouraging verse in all the Bible is what Paul writes towards the end of his life in 2 Timothy, talking about Demas, who was once one of his protégés in the faith. He says, Demas has departed into Thessalonica, having loved this present world. You know people like that? I had a guy who had a tremendous influence on my life growing up. I was somewhat scared of water, still am to a certain extent, live within 100 yards of the Ohio River, so that's a real good strategy on my part. But part of my fear of water uh, resulted in me not being baptized at a, at a young age. I made a profession of faith at nine, wasn't baptized till I was 13, and eventually that fear of water just turned into an embarrassment. Well, why didn't you go ahead and follow the Lord in baptism? Couldn't you have done that? And this guy came and visited at our house. And I remember he said, what, what's preventing you from being baptized? And then he asked me to do it. And I said, okay. And about six months after that, I sensed the Lord calling me to preach in that. He was a big influence on my life. You know how you see someone like that. Just had a tremendous family, sharp guy. Just a few years ago, he stopped going to church left his wife, and no longer believes in the faith that he once claimed. It's devastating, is it not? He says if you keep looking to people, they're going to disappoint you in one way or another. You have to consider the one who endured. There's discouragement, but there's also encouragement because the most encouraging verse in all the Bible is when Paul also asked for John Mark to be sent, the one who was on that missionary journey but turned away and went back home. And Paul said, I don't want anything to do with him. And Barnabas went with him and tried to encourage him in the Lord. But he said, send John Mark to me now because he is helpful to me in the ministry. Friends, if you're here this morning and you're off track, you can get back on track in the Lord. He offers that to us. So how do we not grow weary or faint-hearted? By considering Him who endured. So if you're a young mom who's exhausted and overwhelmed, you feel you don't have any help at all, you've got to look to the One who endured. 
If you're here today and you're having to consider home health care for your mom and dad and all the frustrations that come with that, or maybe you're on the other end of that and you are one of those aging parents and you're having to deal with your intrusive kids, consider Him who endured. You get up and down, you do the same things every day and it seems like there's no way out. you got to look to the One who endured. So many who say, I don't feel appreciated, I don't feel like I'm thanked by my church, by my family, by my colleagues. you got to look to Jesus because they didn't thank Him either. Have you considered Him who endured? Many of us, He says, we haven't shed our blood to this point. And then He says, here's the way that you will endure by looking unto Jesus, but also by not disregarding the discipline of the Lord. Discipline has a negative context in our world, but in the Scripture, it's actually meant to be restorative. It's meant to be positive in the life of a believer. Now, I know no parent has ever done this in this church because all of you have perfect children, but if you know someone who may not have a perfect child, have you ever seen a kid who, who, who needs to be corrected in public, but mom or dad aren't doing anything about it? Maybe you've seen an adult like that too, and I mean, they're just throwing a tantrum. They are letting it all out, and mom and dad act like the world isn't changing at, at all. I remember an Andy Griffith episode called Opie and the Spoiled Kid, where Opie saw the spoiled kid get everything he wants just by throwing a tantrum, and so Opie decides he's going to do the same thing in front of his dad. And every once in a while, in between the squalls, he's, 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 got, his, he's got his arm over his eyes, and he looks up just to see what dad's doing. And dad's just going right on about it. Discipline is important. If you love your kids at all, you discipline them, do you not? And a God who does not discipline his kids is a God who does not love his kids. And so he disciplines us. You ever think about why people get away with some of the stuff that you don't get away with? Like how come they can sin and get away with it or they can do something that's maybe a little bit below the line, but when you try to do the same thing, you get caught? Have you ever thought, why, why does that happen to me? Because you're a child of God. And if you can't sin and get away with it, at least you know whose side you're on. <laughs> I wish sometimes that I could get away with stuff, but God doesn't let us, does He? He disciplines you because He loves you. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord has compassion on us. He will not always chide, neither will He keep His anger forever. And one of the ways that God does discipline is through His church. Now, there's a culture of church discipline in America that's no longer there, that kind of public shaming, moral disapproval, where you take Hester Prynne and Nathaniel Hawthorne's famous scarlet letter and you parade her through the town. And I'm glad that's no longer there, that needed to come down with the legalism. But I think sometimes it's been replaced with a cheap grace that really isn't grace. And so what the media will tell us to do is that any type of rebuke or correction is self-righteous in nature. Just do what you want, when you want, with whom you want. Sometimes in the church culture, we're tempted to say, just do whatever, just show up, it'll all be okay. And they portray as anything outside of that, as calling out sin for what it is, they portray that as hateful. But you know what's really hateful? Seeing someone in sin and leaving them there. Because on the judgment day, they will not be thanking you if that is you. See, anything we have to say, we say it in love. Not punishing, but correcting. And the worst thing that could happen to you is that you would not experience God's discipline. Because he says, if you haven't experienced God's discipline, then you're ultimately not one of his kids. That if you refuse to take rebuke or correction, you don't know God. But more importantly, he doesn't know you. And if you can sin and get away with it, there is something terribly wrong in your life. And the measurement of your faith and your effectiveness as a believer is how you take rebuke, how you take correction, and how you take discipline. I saw this morning a Facebook post from, from Richard Basham. He sold the, the Volvo yesterday, the Volvo station wagon. If you don't know anything about it, it's got almost 300,000 miles. It's been in the greater Hallsville area for almost the past three decades. And I've had the privilege of... Uh, of being in that car, and I'm sorry I didn't get to say goodbye. I told you that this morning, but it, it, is, it is what it is. One of the most memorable experiences I had, though, 
is going hiking. That's the vehicle we usually take because Tug the dog gets to sit in the back. Well, Tug the dog is a very clever dog. He can go off for miles and come back. He, he knows exactly where he's going. Until one day his curiosity got the better of him. As we were coming around the corner talking about solving world problems, I saw Richard just stop in his tracks and he looked up and about 30 yards off, Tug the dog was staring face to face with a skunk. And Richard yelled out, Tug, no! And Tug didn't respond, but in his mind he went, yes. And Tug went at that skunk and Tug got sprayed by that skunk. And the thing is about being on a hiking trail, you know, you, uh, you, you can't just get in your car and go right back home. You got to walk to be able to do it. And so we got to walk with Tug the dog back to the car. And then we got to get in with the car. And I can tell you with the air going full blast and with the windows down, it still didn't help at all. I can, I can taste that dog smell in my mouth even today, several months after. But I tell you what I most remember about it is that after a while, Tug was, he was in a pretty bad spot with his, with his nose being sensitive and everything else. I mean, he was just having a rough time getting back to the car. But after a while, Tug tried to play it off like nothing was going on. So he would go out ahead of us like he normally did, just wagging his tail back and forth. And I'm telling you, you could smell this dog from a quarter mile off. And he's trying to play it like nothing is going on, like the world is just fine. I think that a believer who is in open, unrepentant sin often tries to act just like Tug the dog. We try to act like we've got it all together. We try to act like, man, everything's good. And the smell and the stench of sin is just all over us. And so are you the person on the airplane who when you see something on someone's face but you don't know that person, are you the one who says, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to embarrass them? Or are you the person that says, hey, you've got something on your face. You probably need to get it off. I want to help you. Well, we as believers are supposed to be the latter. That if we say that we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God's church is meant to have one another's backs, to speak the truth in love. To know that you may be mad at us right now, but on the day of judgment, you won't be because the word of God is profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness. And what God is doing right now in your life is he is preparing you to live with him forever. And so you say to yourself, why do I suffer? Because you're a child of God. Here's something to think about. If God's perfect plan did not prevent Jesus from experiencing pain, Don't be surprised if your path has difficult moments too. Why do you have to endure? For discipline. And to keep in mind that anything God does to you, He does it for your good, that we may share His holiness, a holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And by the way, not all discipline is because of sin, is it not? God disciplined Job. The Bible says in all this, Job did not sin against the Lord. Verse 11, the writer says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You're not going to like this, but just as no pain and no gain is true in body, it is also true in soul. And if you're not hurting on some level or another, you're probably not in the game like you ought to be. Sam Chan wrote a book a couple of years ago. It's called Leadership Pain. His thesis is that your capacity for influence and your capacity for leadership is directly related to how much pain that you can endure. I'm in a small mentoring group with Jason Pettis, who's pastor of Living Hope Baptist Church in Bowling Green. We meet about once a quarter just to to go over some different things. And he talks about this aspect of pain. That the pain that you can endure in ministry and in life will determine how long you last and how much influence that you have. You know, Mr. T is really on to something in Rocky Three when they say, what do you predict for the fight? He says, pain. That's true for the Christian's life as well. But do you know what is a greater pain than living in the will of God? Living outside of the will of God. It's so much better to live for God than to live away from God. God, and the more influence that you have, the more Satan comes against you, and he often uses the very people you thought were with you. 
And so you've got to expect pain. And listen, if you don't like pain, the Christian life is probably not for you. I would just encourage you in this. Refuse to feel sorry for yourself. Don't throw a pity party. Nobody wants to come. Understand that this is a light, momentary affliction, that when that pain comes, take it as a discipline from the Father, that this discipline is meant to be a blessing and not a burden, that the crown of thorns eventually turns into a crown of glory. You see, if if all your faith is to you is a way to solve your personal problems, you're not going to get the results you want. You're going to be disappointed. But if you're in it for the long haul, then this light, momentary affliction to where Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Then in a world that is today in constant change, nothing has changed about the promises of God. And in the meantime, he tells us to rejoice, to be exceeding glad, knowing that suffering will not last, but the Son will. Will. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, berryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.